A reading from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness as shoes for your feet Put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the spirit at all times in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Now may the words of my mouth be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. A welcome to this final message on the book of Ephesians. Not the final one ever, but in this series on Ephesians. I've had a good time with this book. I have been blessed by this book. And I hope you have been as well. We have been gleaning these beautiful little nuggets of wisdom and love and exploring them together on Sunday morning. If you never got around to reading it, you still can do that. We just won't be talking about it on Sunday mornings for a while. We've learned in these weeks together that we all are chosen by God in Christ before the foundations of the earth were laid. And that just knocks me over every time I say it to you. And we are blessed with every blessing in the heavenly places. And that is true regardless of the circumstances of our lives. We are yet blessed when life is hard and it feels like we're not being blessed. We are blessed. And last week, we, we talked a couple of weeks ago about the, the dimensions of God's love. It is so vast. Do you remember how we talked about it? God's love is so high you can't, and it's so low you can't, and it's so wide you can't, you got to go in through the door. And that means that that love is enough for each one of us. There's enough of God's love to love Deborah Lerner and each one of you. And it also means that there's enough room in God's love to love people that you wish he didn't love and to want them included. People you would prefer not to have in the pew with you are also a part of that wonder of God's love. And last week we talked about the lifestyle that we are able to live because of all of these things that God has already done for us, with us, in us, through us, and all of the things God is doing right now in all of those ways and all of the things we know we can count on God to do forever and ever, we can choose a different way of, of living because of that. And that way of life is characterized by things like patience and gentleness and bearing with one another in love and telling the truth and shining the light of God's love into all the dark places in the world. And we talked in that sermon about how we are all children of God, beloved children of God, for whom Christ died. And we're meant to act like that. And we're meant to talk 
as if we were beloved children of God. And now today in chapter 6, we're in a little bit of a different space. We're looking at the reality that it can be a little challenging to live that life because we have an adversary that is always working against us. Now, it is not fashionable in the United Methodist Church in 2018 to talk about that adversary who in this passage of Scripture is referred to as the devil and, and many pas passages of Scripture, including those in which Jesus was speaking. There's reference to this, this almost person called the devil. But our founding father, John Wesley, talked often about the devil. He was in those years before we got so scholarly in our study of the Bible. And Wesley was constantly warning us about the need to be watchful and strong, lest the devil get the best of us. I went through his sermons, and I found in sermon number 42, which is called Satan's Devices, a bunch of ways that John Wesley thought Satan undermines the work of God in our hearts and in our minds. Wesley talks about how when we first come to Christ, when we first really receive the gospel, the good news, that God's love is for us in spite of who we are, that Christ died for us, in spite of who we are, that we are forgiven, that we are redeemed, that we have a place in the kingdom of God. When all of that becomes real to us for the first time, there is a, a wonderful sense of joy and elation. And John Wesley refers to that joy on that conversion as the first work of the soul. And he says what's really happening there is the kingdom of God is taking up residence inside each one of us, and we are having this incredible joy in life. And that can happen again and again as we move through life, actually, as we forget and come back to the truth of the gospel, and, and we kind of stray a little bit, or it just becomes too routine, and then we get it again, and, and there's this recognition of all that God has done for us. That joy and elation can be rekindled in the human heart and in the human spirit. And Wesley says that's the time when you got to watch out, because that's when you're vulnerable to the work of Satan. Uh, he writes this. Now, this is the grand device of Satan to destroy the first work of God in the soul, or at least to hinder its increase. So Wesley conceived that when we first come to Christ and have that joy and elation, that's the place that the devil, however you understand that, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that's the place where the devil is going to come at us. He says this is how it happens. He says, first of all, Satan comes to damp our joy in the Lord by the consideration of our own vileness and sinfulness and unworthiness. So at first we say, thank you, God, thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And then we go away and we're sitting at home and we're like, maybe I got that wrong. Maybe I'm one for whom it, I, I, maybe I'm too bad. Maybe it's not really for me. That's what John Wesley says happens. That's the first thing that happens. And then he says, the second thing that happened is, is that Satan attacks our peace and gives us thoughts like this one. Are you fit to see God? God is holy. You're unholy. How is it possible that you, unclean as you are, should be in a state of acceptance with God? And so there are these seeds of doubt about what has been given to us. And we begin to question the gift because we don't think we deserve it. And Wesley says that's, that's the, the work of Satan. Wesley says Satan is a, a wily adversary, that he's always undermining the work of Christ's love and causing us to think that we don't deserve that love and question how Christ could really love us, cast doubt in our own hearts and minds that this gospel is true. And the remedy is to fight back. The remedy is to hold fast to the truth that we have been given and to stand on the promises of Scripture. We're going to sing that song in a moment, standing on the promises. 
And the promise is that our salvation does not depend on our worthiness. It depends on God's love. But that's a real and lifelong battle. Paul describes that a battle. I'm going to go back to Ephesians 6:12. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh. It is against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now that's scary language. When I read that, I, it just kind of makes the hairs on my arm stand up. We are up against a big adversary. Are you hearing that? I, I'm going to read it to you from the message. This one will come up on the screen. Ephesians 6, starting at the 10th verse. I'm going to go back a little bit. That about wraps it up. God is strong, and he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you, well-made weapons of the best materials, and put them to use so that you will be able to stand up to everything the devil throws your way. Now, the good news in that is that God is going to give us what we need. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. Be prepared. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Does that make it clearer? We really should not expect this journey with Christ to be easy. We should expect a, an incredible struggle, a lifelong battle. I think people need to know this. We need to remind each other that this is effortful because we run at Jesus. If we follow him, we need to look at what happened to him he ran into the powers of evil at every turn, massive powers of evil. His life was difficult. Why would we as his followers have easy lives? Now, I don't know how you conceive of the adversary. There are so many ways to, to think about this. Some people really think about the devil as the personification of evil almost like a person, a person in the same sense that God is, and Christ is a, is a person, but a, a person with all malice. Now, maybe that's how you think about it. That's kind of the picture that the Bible gives. That that's the language of the Bible. But some people who have studied more think about evil in the world and evil in the human hearts in different terms. They think about Evil as the real and natural consequence of bad human choices, really bad human choices, over uh, eons of time. Choices that are opposed to the will of God and the way of God. And what I say about that is you see it on the news every night. You can't turn on the news without knowing that there is massive evil in the world. I don't know how we could ever watch that and not believe that there are powers of evil. There's murder and mayhem and rape and racism and all kinds of things all the time. However, you conceive of that. I mean, you need to take it seriously. There's, we need to struggle with this why. Why is there so much ungodly stuff? Paul clearly acknowledges the presence of evil. Wesley clearly acknowledges the presence of evil and says that it can stop us dead in our tracks, in our growth with Christ. And, and both say that, you know, we, we have to be prepared. We have to commit our hearts and our lives to opposing evil and to opposing the evil one. Because it turns out that seeking the goodness of God involves fighting against all of the things that are going to get in the way. Now, if this sounds far out to you, I'm going I'm to bring you back to something that is completely Methodist and completely today in the Methodist church. And that is what we ask people when they come forward for baptism or when they bring a child for baptism or when they've been away from the church and from faith for a while, and they come back and they reaffirm their faith. Here is the first thing that we ask them. We put them up in front of the church and we say, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject 
the evil powers of this world and repent of your sin. And you have to say, yes, I do, to, to come into faith and to come into the church. There's an acknowledgement there of the need to renounce spiritual forces of wickedness, to set them aside. There's a need to reject evil powers that otherwise would overwhelm you. I, I think sometimes we read these vows and we don't hear what they're saying. So I'm pulling them up and putting them before you as a reminder. I am um, a closet channel 21 watcher. Do you know the religious channel? I don't get to watch it except every other week when I, my son is with me, he's in charge of the remote control, but every other week I get to choose. <laughs> and so a lot of the time I don't, I'd have the smallest cable package that you can have, so there's really not a lot of variety on that package. I just can't pay what they want, so I, I have this little bitty package, but it has channel 21. And so I watch these preachers who are so unlike Methodist preachers, and one of them that I watch a lot when I can is Joyce Meyer. Do we have any Joyce Meyer fans here? I love Joyce Meyer. I just love the way she just says it like it is. And she just says, man, you want the grace, of, you want the blessings of God, but you're not willing to, to, to do the work. Get up and do the work. I mean, so I just love her. I'd love to be more like that. Well, she, I turned on the Channel 21 right when I was in this preparation for this sermon. And she was doing a sermon on how we have to recognize the voice of the adversary. And we have to respond to the voice of the adversary, to the voice of Satan. And she says, here's how you recognize it. You, and in fact, when I was watching this, I, was, I had already looked at this Wesley sermon. I think she, I was thinking, she sounds like John Wesley. She, here's what she said. She says, when, when you feel insecurity in your heart about your salvation, when you feel fear, when you worry that you just don't measure up, when you find yourself reluctant to respond to God's call because you don't think you have what it takes, you need to recognize that those voices are not from God. You need to say, no, that is not the truth of who I am. Because that's not what this book tells me I am. That's not who God says I am. And she says, you need, to, you need to reject those voices. And she says, you should do it out loud. Get behind me, Satan. I'm not going to listen to that because that's not God. I know who I am in God. Stop telling me those lies. And there's something about that I kind of like. And I kind of like it especially because of my personal experience. You see, I knew I was called by God for years before I responded. Years. And a little, little group of women that were we gathered together, we looked at our past, our present, and what God might be calling us to. And I said, well, I, th I think God's calling me to be a pastor. And we all laughed. And it was years after that that I responded to that call. I knew it was there. And every time I thought about it, I thought, well, I can't do that. I have a Jewish husband that's really agnostic and... Our family life isn't what a pastor's family life ought to be, and I'm not what a pastor ought to be, and I, and, and I would just go on, and I just, nobody ever taught me to say, no, that's not God. I wonder how many years I would have saved. You know, I, I, I got into the social work program at ASU. I got, and I, that didn't work out, and I, Something happened, and I didn't start. So then I got into the Master of Counseling program. I went and took the GRE after being out of school so long, I couldn't remember any of that stuff. And I passed it. Thank you, Jesus. And I got in the Master of Counseling program, and that didn't work out. All of these ways, I was trying not to answer the call of God because I didn't feel worthy. Oh, that I would have known to say, that's not what this tells me about who I am. That's not God. Be quiet. I'm not going to listen to you. Do you hear me? I mean, I wonder if there are others here who've had that kind of experience. For some people, it isn't that sense of insecurity and lack of confidence and lack of worthiness. For some people, I think the challenge may be that we hear voices that say, you don't need God. You've got this all together. I mean, you... 
I can do this. I don't need God. And I just want to say to you that if that's what, how you're feeling, I, that's another lie from the father of lies, from Satan. Satan is referred to in the Bible as the father of lies. And that would be a lie. And that would be a lie that you need to say, that's not the truth. That's not God. You need to say to the adversary, be quiet. You know, the second vow of affirmation of faith is like this. It says, do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And what this is saying is there's a battle going on. You know, we're, we need to join the battle. And if we join the battle, God will give us the power to win it. The battle is against evil. The battle against, is against injustice and against oppression. We have everything we need to win the battle. And Paul says that in this chapter of Ephesians. He says we have the belt of truth, the truth of Jesus Christ who died to set us free. Jesus Christ is the truth with a capital T. We have the breastplate of righteousness, which is really just the right relationship with God. We are protected, maybe not from physical harm, but from spiritual harm by our right relationship with God. That's what righteousness is. We have the shield of faith, which is our trust and confidence that what this book tells us is the truth. And that means we can stand firm. We have the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the, the very Word of God. The Word of God that points to the Word of God, the living Word, Jesus the Christ. And that's our armor in our struggle against the adversary. I'm going to go back to the message and finish this, this passage from the message. Take all the help you can get every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words. Learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. God's word is an indispensable weapon. In the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and long. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. Keep each other's spirit up so that no one falls behind or drops out. Do you hear what's being said? Our primary weapons are the word of God that point to the word of God, the living word, Jesus, and prayer. You know, we pray at all times in every prayer and supplication. We rest our hope in the word that points to Jesus Christ, our Savior and our salvation. And that is enough to win the battle. It is enough. Thanks be to God.